Ephesians chapter 5 tonight, if you would, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we started last week <coughs> in talking about uh, being a leader uh, slash a servant, because as we discussed last week, the, <coughs> the biblical form of leadership is servant leadership. Jesus said how the Gentiles exercise lordship, but we exercise servanthood, and that's how we, uh, that's what it means to be a servant leader. If your focus or our focus is to being a boss or in control of everything, we will struggle. Being a leader according to God's standard is to be a servant, and that has been our focus and will continue to be as we go throughout this uh, little uh, couple of weeks series. Uh, being a servant should manifest itself in every aspect of our relationships in life, whether that be tonight in discipleship, we talked about the work uh, boss employee relationship and how we should be at work. And that, of course, should be an area where we display servanthood. But nowhere should it be seen clearer than in the home. I, uh, I found something kind of humorous as I talk to people. If you've ever asked people when was the best, when the best times of their life was, and you'll get answers, but most of the time it was when they were young uh, or just after the kids left the house. There's that about 25-year period in there that usually gets skipped over. Now, we, of course, enjoy our kids, and, and, uh, but it can get trying sometimes, can't it? It's not the easiest thing to be what we need to be at home. Now, the text uh, for our sermon tonight is often considered a hard, difficult passage of Scripture, and it is in, for several reasons. Number one, it's hard to live. The Christian life is not difficult to understand. It is harder to live sometimes. But secondly, it goes against all the societal norms that you see in the world today. If you, you're not going to find Ephesians chapter 5, five too much in Everyone Loves Raymond. Okay? You're not going to find it in, in Hollywood productions uh, that they put out in movies and such. But every time we do things God's way, we're always going to result in harmony and peace. If we could live this passage in our homes, there would never need to be a message like we have tonight. But it is something we probably all struggle with on some level. So let's dig in tonight, shall we? Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 22, and we're going to read right into chapter 6. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's it, message over. You guys got it? Okay, enough said, amen? Ah, there's more, we'll get to that. Uh, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. But I, just to pause there for a minute, I find this so timeless. Uh, have you ever noticed the difference between when a woman looks into a mirror and when a man looks into a mirror? If, you ever, if you've ever been by a mall or somewhere where there's a full-length side mirror at the wall, this is how a woman will walk past that mirror. She doesn't want to see anything in there. She might be beautiful and perfect in every way, but does not want to see what she's in there. A man can be bald-headed, pot-bellied, and he'll muscle up to that. Yep, still got it, you know. Because men don't hate their own bodies. We just accept it for whatever it is, amen? Uh, women hate their bodies. Men don't usually hate their bodies. I just think that's such a timeless truth in there. It's nice to know things haven't changed much since this was written. So, Back to our text, verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. <coughs> Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and mayest live long on the earth. 
And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. A servant at home is our uh, message title tonight. A servant at home. Father, I pray you'd help us in the next few minutes here as we break this passage down. May it be a particular challenge to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Often a home is a power struggle, and everyone within it is involved in this power struggle. Kids are disobedient to parents, teenagers resisting every rule and relationship in the home, wives usurping the husband's leadership, husbands thinking their role is to be the dictator in the home. All of this can be rectified with one thing, and that is to have the spirit of a servant. If we have the spirit of a servant, we'll overcome these problems. And servanthood should begin at home. If it doesn't begin there, it's probably not going to be seen anywhere else consistently. It needs to be in the home. There's three reasons why servanthood should begin at home. Number one, that's where you're seen for what you really are. It's kind of hard to hide who you really are at home. That's where you're seen for the reality of your personality. That's where your public persona and your reputation are set aside. Your family usually knows you better than anybody else does. The people who know you best see you for what you really are. So that's one reason it should start at home. Secondly, that's where the values of life are translated to the next generation. The strength of a nation derives from the integrity of a home. Children don't do what you say. Children do what you do. That's an unfortunate truth, isn't it? Uh, I wish they would do what I say, but they do what I do. And that's something that sometimes we, it becomes a struggle. Uh, they become what you are. And that's a very frightening thought, or it can be. And dad and mom should never take that lightly. Home is where the children learn to be servants, where they learn to be gracious, or they learn bad habits and bad traits instead. Uh, they can learn to be selfish and difficult like most people are in this world. And so it's important that servanthood start at home because that's where the, ne the values are translated to the next generation. As the home goes, so goes the nation. And we see, obviously, a decline in both today. The third reason is that a, spirit, a servant spirit is needed most desperately in the closest relationships of life. W why is it easy to be a really great servant to people that you barely know? You ever notice that? It's easy to do that. When the ones at home who you claim to love the most, it's easier to be mean and demanding with them. It does not require much investment to serve someone who's barely in your life. It can be a one and done. There is no continual responsibility. You can go about the day and the rest of your life feeling good because you did something for that person that you'll probably never see again. It's a little different when it has to be lived out 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Servanthood would be easy if the only people you serve are anonymous people you'd never see again. It's a little more difficult when it's those around the breakfast table. It's a little more different, uh, difficult in the living room. It demands more of you. It demands you be consistent day after day after day. So if servanthood doesn't begin at home, I wonder if it'll ever be seen at all on a consistent basis. What does a servant look like at home? We're going to break it down tonight. How can you spot a servant's heart in the home? So let's begin with, uh, I know the Bible began with women, but we'll get to them second. We'll begin tonight with the men. All, this is a statement I heard somewhere, all marriages are happy. All marriages are happy. It's the living together afterward that causes all the trouble. Amen? Anybody uh, can identify with that. Men are not always known to be the most sensitive creatures. That's not a shock, probably, to any of us here tonight. I heard a, of one couple that was in marriage counseling, and the marriage counselor had talked to them separately, and now they were together. And uh, so he says to the husband, Your wife says that you never buy her flowers. Is this true? And the husband said, you know, to be honest, Doc, I didn't even know she sold flowers. Take you just a second there. But that's how men can be sometimes, a little bit insensitive, okay? Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Now, we begin tonight by talking to the husbands, husbands and fathers. And it really begins with you. It's interesting that in our text, 
there's twice as much space dedicated to address the husbands as it is to the wives. And this is not an accident. It's as if Paul is sending us a message about the importance of the husband and pastor, I mean, sorry, husband and father role in the home. This is something that is fast deteriorating in our society today. The father figure is made out to be a buffoon in many of our sitcoms and uh, television shows. And they like to do that because whatever God deems important, the devil is always going to try to chip away at its importance. But for husbands and for men, one word sums it all up. It's interesting that for wives it talks about submitting and and reverencing and different things. For husbands, it just uses really one word. Husbands, love. Love your wives. The word here is agape. Now, there's three primary words in the Greek language for the word love. It has different, all translates the English word love, but it has different original words. There's agape, eros, and philos, or uh, uh, philo, a uh, philo. Phileo, that's what I'm trying to spit out here. Phileo. Uh, So eros, as obviously you can probably get that from our word erotic, that means sexual love. It's never used in the New Testament. But phileo or phylos is used in a number of ways. That means brotherly love. It's a friendship type of love. It is a natural affection. It is uh, when you see somebody that is attractive to you and you are attracted to them, that is phileo. Uh, but agape love is what is used in this passage here. And agape love is a different kind of love. It's a self-giving love, one that knows no limits, a love that expects nothing in return. Agape is the word that the Bible uses to describe God's love for us. For God so loved the world, agape. That's the type of love this is talking about. It is not uh, husband's eros, your wife, or husband's phileo, your wife. It is husbands agape your wife. Husbands love your wives means their self-sacrifice and self-denying love. Husbands love your wives means that's a love that has no limits. It is one that should consume uh, the husband. The text talks about the husband as the head of the wife. And of course, I talk much about that. I believe it's scriptural and biblical that a husband is the spiritual head of the home. To be the head of the home speaks of a responsibility. It speaks of an accountability. Someday, men, you are going to stand before God and give account for your family. And that's an awesome thought as a father and as a husband for me. It does not matter. You can't come to God, oh, you don't understand, Lord, I gave that responsibility over to her. No, it doesn't happen that way. Because you're going to be responsible whether you take the responsibility or not. Because God holds you in that position. And so, uh, a lot of fathers today are AWOL spiritually. Many Christian fathers have defected, leaving their wives and children to go whatever direction they go. Often, wives, bless their heart, have to step into that spiritual role when it should not be the case. A great problem in America today is the problem of father absence. Single-parent homes in America is up 300% in the past 30 years. Violent crime has risen 600% in that same period. Interesting, because there is obviously a connection, and I'm not going to go into it tonight, but uh, there's lots of statistics that support those two working in conjunction. Why? Because the father makes a big difference in the home. When the father is not there, his absence makes a great big difference in the home as well. We as men need to understand and think about the awesome responsibility that God lays on the shoulders of husbands and fathers. No wonder the word is agape. It's a love that knows no limits. So what is the husband's, the father's role? It is one of servant leadership. It is not the boss. It is not the dictator. It is the servant leader. That's the type of leadership we're talking about from the Bible tonight. How is a father to love his family? Here's three answers to that question. He's to love his family by putting his family first in his emotions and affections. Putting the family first. So many fathers miss that. When we understand the most important obligation that God gives us as men, our wives, our children, our families. I've never known a man, you probably haven't either, that gets to the end of their life and wishes he'd have spent less time with his family and spent more time at work. Usually it's the other way around. We regret at the end sometimes what we didn't invest when we had the chance. Many, many, many have said, And some, many have even said to me, I wish I'd have spent more time with my family. To serve your family, you put them first in your time, in your affections, 
and in your concerns. I read this illustration to prove his love for her. He swam the deepest river, crossed the widest deserts, climbed the highest mountains. She divorced him because he was never home. Uh, We need to put our family first, and one way to do that is be there, amen? Be there, make them important. Number two, you serve your family when you protect them. Now, a husband and a father serves his family by doing exactly that, protecting them. That does not only mean that you get your shotgun ready and uh, get ready to shoot an intruder. That's uh, maybe a small part of the protection of your family. But we're talking about protecting them from outside influences. Make sure the Internet is protected. Make sure the phones are protected. Uh, and, and say, I don't know about those things. Learn. If you're a parent, learn and uh, take care of that. Find, talk to the youth pastor. or the, uh, They'll help you learn those things. Talk to your seven-year-old grandchild. They'll teach you how to do those type of things. We need to learn it because we need to protect them. Know your children's friends. Know where they are. Know where they're going and what they're doing. Number three, a husband and father serves his family by praying for them. Men, have you prayed for your families today? Husbands, have you prayed for your wives? Have you prayed for your children? It starts with us, men, and uh, God expects that. Oh, we want to be the head. We want to make the call. We want to make the decisions. If we want to see the spirit of servanthood at home, it's got to start with you. Wives wilt under dominance and flourish under tender loving care. Servanthood must start in the home, and it must start with husbands who truly love their wives, fathers who truly love their children, men who will put their families first and who will protect and pray for them. Then let's get to women uh, in, in this passage. Now, there's a great philosopher that said that trying to understand women is like trying to smell the color nine. And I know that's not, we're not going to undertake it tonight and try to do all that, uh, to, but we are going to talk about what this text says about wives. Notice there's two different words given here. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And then in verse 33, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. There are two different words there. One is to submit yourself or put yourself under authority. The other is reverence, which means to hold in affectionate regard. Understand that this isn't so much a legal requirement as a spirit or an attitude of the heart. This ought to be regularly communicated to the husband and to the family. A group of women were at a seminar on how to live in loving relationship with their husbands. And so the woman that was giving the speech there and talking to them asked, uh, <coughs> how many of you love your husband? All the women raised their hands. And then she asked, when's the last time you told your husband you loved him? Got a little quiet then. So uh, they, they were told to do a little exercise. And what they did, they were all supposed to take out their phone and they were supposed to text their husband right then and there, I love you, uh, I love you, sweetheart and uh, send that to him, and then trade the phone with the woman next to them, and then the women read the responses. These are some of them. Who is this? Uh, Number two, uh, mother of my children, are you sick or what? Uh, Number three, yeah, and I love you too. What's wrong? What now? Did you wreck the car again? I don't understand what you mean. What do you need? What did you do now? (laughs) That's a big one. Uh, Don't beat around the bush, just tell me how much you need. Am I dreaming? If you don't tell me who this message is actually for, someone will die. I thought we agreed you wouldn't drink during the day. Your mother is coming to stay with us, isn't she? Those are some of the responses to I love you, sweetheart. Submission is believing that God can work through your husband to accomplish his will in your life. Submission is not just a matter of obedience. It's a matter of the heart. It is believing that God said what God said he will do and that uh, he can be trusted. It's believing that God will enable you by the Holy Spirit to do everything he has called you to do. To do. Now, it's, you know, we talk a lot about this, uh, about the submission part, and often we leave the, the men's part out of it. But I really believe the, what a man is told to do in Ephesians 5 is more difficult than what a woman's called to do. Because we're called to love as we love our own bodies and love as Christ loved the church. That's a tall order. And I believe that if we, gentlemen, do our part in loving as Christ loved the church, 
Submission won't be a big problem. That's kind of a natural response to that. How is a Christian wife to serve her husband and children? By listening, by encouraging, by cultivating a calm and gentle spirit. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it talks about the Christian wife and the unbelieving husband, and it talks about the gentle and calm spirit. Without argument, a Christian wife can win her unbelieving husband through what the Bible calls her chaste conversation. I believe if the husband is the head of the home, the wife is certainly the heart of the home. Though the husband is the head, she sets the emotional tone of the home. You go to an, into any home, and if the wife is depressed, the home will be depressed. We even have a cutesy saying for it. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's, uh, and we use it, and sometimes we laugh about it, but there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, it reflects the biblical truth that God has given wives and mothers the privilege of setting within the home the emotional tone. If the wife is encouraged, the home will typically be encouraged. If she has a quiet spirit, there will be a quiet gentleness there. On the other hand, if she lays into her husband, if she disrespects him and attacks him on a regular basis, she had better not be shocked when the kids do not respect her either and lay into her. You see, what it's a sick, a little, sick, it's a circular thing. Amen? Can't say the right word. There's a book uh, written by Richard Foster who, when he says this, Submission frees us from the terrible burden of having to have our own way. Sometimes that can be a burden. Submission. By the way, we submit to Christ, men. As we submit to Christ, they submit to us, then it'll, that's the recipe for a well-lived home. Uh, he he uh, goes on to say how most of us live in a terrible bondage of thinking that we have to be in control. We have to have our own way all the time. Submission frees you from that. By the way, the Bible does say that we are to submit to one another, too. That's talking about when when it's time to go out to eat and she has no idea where to go, she wears, knows where not to go, and you submit to that, okay? That's a whole other story we won't get into, all right? Uh, how many people today uh, are angry and stressed out instead who could learn joy and peace by letting go and submitting? Men to the Lord, wives to their husbands. All right, we finish up here in chapter 6 with children. There's two words highlighted here, to obey and to honor. To obey is to simply do what someone else says. To honor is to treat with dignity and respect. All of us know, it's no question, I think all of us realize the home is breaking down today in America. There's a tax. I could give you a quote after quote that I've collected from uh, secular people in the world talking about how we must take down the nuclear home. They don't even hide it anymore. A nuclear home being a mom, a dad, and kids that belong to that mom and dad. It's almost a foreign concept today. Uh, but that's what they refer to as a nuclear family. We have to take them down if we're going to further uh, the cause of the LGBTQ, EIEIO uh, groups and all those type of people. We're going to have to attack the nuclear family, and they are doing so. Uh, and we know that it's breaking down, so we don't have to be convinced of that. Uh, but there is a uh, shocking breakdown of moral authority today. All you have to do is to look at schools and... <clears throat> See kids shooting kids? We had an 11-year-old commit suicide in Brookings a few weeks ago. I mean, this, uh, this has happened to our children. This is not a gun problem. This is a heart problem with our children today. <clears throat> Why has there been such a breakdown? Well, we've already talked about it a little bit. A father absence is a big reason for it. A permissive generation is a big reason for it. Shocking lack of moral values and absolutes in America today a lack of discipline and accountability? How do we teach our children to love, obey, and honor their parents? Well, we could start. This is such a foreign concept. I know not to people in here, but in our society today, uh, but, and this is almost hate speech, but I'm going to say it anyway. By saying no to your kids once in a while. You can do that. Uh, a lot of parents don't do that, ever. But we need to say no. We need to set limits. We need to build fences. We need to not be afraid to parent our kids. We're not there to buddy with our kids. We're there to parent our kids. I haven't, I told my kids growing up, of course we want to get along and stuff, but I've always told my kids, I have enough friends. I don't, I'm not looking for more friends. I'm your father, not your friend. Now, I want to be friends, but that's not the priority. It's a parent that we need to be. By honoring your parents, uh, this is something that needs to be emphasized more and more saying no with love, setting boundaries. 
your children will learn to honor you by watching you honor one another, mom and dad. Children, again, don't do what you say. They do what you do. And so they need to see that. To the parents, he said in verse 4, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath. In Colossians 3.21, he said, fathers provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. Do not frustrate them, provoke them, embitter them. How do we do that? With unrealistic expectations, with undue negativity, and with a lack of praise. How then do parents serve their children? Don't forget again, we're talking about servant leadership. If you're the parent, you are called to serve your children. How many kids agree with that? Amen? All right, stick with me because it might not look the way you think it looks. Uh, but parents serve their children, number one, by praying for them. Now, we knew we were going to come to that, don't we? We need to pray for our kids. Susanna Wesley had 19 children. She was the mother of Charles Wesley, John Wesley. She spent an hour with each child every week, one-on-one. -on -one. <coughs> she prayed for each child every day. They all ended up serving the Lord. Some of them did great, great things for God. Mrs. Wesley said, I asked God to get a hold of my children in their youth and never let go. Prayed for them and prayed for them and prayed for them. Secondly, by listening. You serve your children by listening to them. Talk to them. Give them one-on-one -on -one time. Take them to McDonald's, just you and them. Let them talk. One thing I've always liked to do from a young age, I've always taken my girls out on dates, and we, uh, I did that once a week for years and years, still do it not as faithfully as I should, but we do it once in a while. Uh, go out and spend some one-on-one -on -one time. I do one-on-one -on -one camping with my kids and just spend time with them and let them uh, just have that uh, relationship there. It's amazing what you can learn if you stop lecturing and start listening. Just let them talk, and that's a good thing. By Number three, by setting limits. Anarchy begins at home. They can learn to be good citizens or they can learn to be juvenile delinquents at home. You ever seen a kid who you would think is demon-possessed, the way he screams and runs around and destroys things and throws things around and just hits people and screams? And, and uh, I always like, oh, he's just expressing himself or he's just a natural-born leader. Uh, no, Johnny's going to be in prison, so it's going to happen. And uh, if, if we don't serve him by setting some limits, and we do so with love, uh, so that they can then end up serving instead of growing up to be uh, delinquents. If you do not discipline your kids, the courts of this land will do it later. We must, must have some sort of discipline in our homes. So by setting limits. And then that leads us into four, by punishing them. Do we serve our children by punishing them? Absolutely. Absolutely. In Romans chapter 1, we learn the absolute worst thing that God can do for anybody is let them have their own way. Can I tell you the worst thing you as a parent can do for your kids is let them have your own way, uh, their own way. And we've, I use the phrase often, that give a kid and a boy everything they want, you have a good pig and a bad boy. Uh, you, you can't give your kids everything they want and you can't let them do whatever they want. The Bible says that it not, goes, goes much further than this and says in Proverbs 13, 24, that if you don't discipline your children, you hate your children. Now, the world will say if you discipline, you hate them. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you don't discipline them, you hate them. Listen to what it says. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Pretty cut and dried. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And so we need to understand the Bible way is the right way to do it. Amen? I don't really care what society says. Dr. Spock is Dr. Wrong. He, did not, he wasn't right. It is, not, it is not healthy to give a kid a pillow and tell him to scream and curse and hit in the pillow. It's, it's good for, I say this in the right spirit, but it's good for mom and dad to do the hitting once in a while appropriately. Amen? Uh, with a paddle on. You know, God gave them a padded area on their body just for this purpose. All right, let's take advantage of it. And uh, of course, I don't, it goes without saying, I'm totally against abuse and punching and hitting and those type of things, but uh, we ought to do what the Bible says and trust that it knows what it's talking about. Number five, we serve our kids by being there when they really need you. How many times are we so busy we're not there for our children? Be there. Just be there. I know that it's, I know how heartbreaking it is to have a family member check out of a relationship. Let that not be you. 
uh, invest in them, be there when they need you. And then number six, by loving each other. Talk about moms and dads. The best thing for parents to do for their children is to love one another. Gross your kids out by kissing in front of them. Gross. Have you ever noticed, by the way, this bothered me immensely when my girls were at home, teenagers. You can see two unmarried sleazeballs sucking face on TV. It'd be, oh, that's so sweet. When mom and dad do it, ew, gross. You know what? Gross them out. They need it. They need to see it. They need to see affection. They need to see love. And uh, this is something that's important. The best thing you can do for your kids is love one another. Number seven, by praising your children. What gets praised gets repeated. Praise intelligently, by the way. Society gets this wrong. Giving out 39th place trophies, uh, participation trophies. That's not the kind of garbage I'm talking about. Uh, th that promotes losers. I'm talking about, uh, in fact, I said it no better than Samuel Johnson said it. He who praises everybody praises nobody. And so, what I'm talking about is praising character rather than looks. Praising uh, not only their natural ability, but the good things that they do. And I have found that what gets praised gets repeated. Be, f be ready to praise. We're so eager to criticize. We're so quick to be negative. We need to be positive too. My wife and I always taught when the kids were young, we always lived by that principle, 17 positive for every negative. That's hard to do. But every time you give a negative, you try to offset it with 17 positives. And uh, you don't always uh, achieve that, but it's a good principle to go with. <clears throat> and then lastly, by setting the right kind of example. Edgar Guest said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one every day. I'd rather one walk with me than just tell me the way. The eye is a better student than the ear. End quote. And I'll say it again. Like produces like. Kids don't do what, they, uh, what you tell them to do. They do what they see. Don't let your actions speak so loud that your children can't hear what you say. This is true not only in the physical realm, it's also true in the spiritual realm. What you are will be reproduced in the lives that are around you. When you are dead and gone, you'll still be walking the streets through the people that you have impacted with your life. It will be in the character of your children. So let us then work to promote a servant's heart by having a servant's heart, and by being a servant in our home. And that promote. Do you remember that, uh, there's an old country song, I, I'm beginning to see my father in me. I see that more and more. The older I get, the more I see dad. Soon I'll be limping, you know. I, I don't know how long that'll take. But uh, I see my dad in me more and more as I get older. And I, I found it interesting. Sometimes I've met young men that, that hate their fathers or hate what their fathers are. And I'll never be like my father. And you know what happens. They start to turn into their father. It's just a natural thing. Your kids will become what you are. I'm asking you, what are you? Do you have a servant's heart at home? Do you have a servant's heart that they can learn from? Do you want to be a leader in your home? Be a servant. Be a servant. That'll help.